we'll, uh, we'll get started. My name is Jan Sveinar. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Center on Global Economic Governance. And I would like to start by thanking the uh, co-sponsors of this event. Today we have the SIPA Finance Society and the International Finance and Economic <coughs> Policy Concentration at SIPA being the co-sponsors of this event. Uh, it's a pleasure to have a truly a group of truly esteemed speakers with us uh, this afternoon. Let me just say a few words about each one of them. Uh, Jim Healy, who is sitting here immediately on my left, is the founder of Capra Ibex Advisors, a privately owned registered investment advisor. Prior to that, he worked at Credit Suisse for 25 years, most recently serving as the head of the fixed income division. And before that, he worked in the International Monetary Fund and he serves as vice chairman of student sponsor partners and is on the board of directors for ET, e Trade, rather. And I should say we were classmates at Princeton and uh, in graduate school, and he really was uh, the stellar student uh, in a, I should say, excellent class. <laughs> 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 All right. Sadiq Saeed. He's the chairman of uh, Medich Capital Limited, which is an investment uh, firm based in London. He previously was the CEO of Nomura Europe, having joined the company in 2000 as special advisor. He has over 30 years of experience in investment banking. He spent 15 years at Credit Suisse First Boston, where he was managing director. And prior to his career in investment banking, he was consultant to the World Bank, where we met. and. Uh, he beat me in tennis every day. Decades yeah. later, when I improved. Only because Jim used to beat me. <laughs> That's true, Jim is the, he was the star. Yeah. Exactly. But decades later, when I learned to play tennis a little bit better and challenged Sadek, he said he no longer did that sport. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, Leah Zell is the founder and portfolio manager of Blizzard Investment. Uh, it's a hedge fund that specializes in international small to mid cap securities. She serves as a member of the executive committee and treasurer of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, is a member of New York Council on Foreign Relations, uh, the Harvard Global Advisory Council, and the Wilson Center's Global Advisory Council. She really has a tremendously stellar career in uh, investment, and uh, one that is especially, I think, for the students and everybody interesting because she has a PhD in history, so you can start in a field that's not obviously related to uh, uh, banking and um, investment and uh, reach uh, considerable fame. I was very pleased when uh, I was doing my PhD, she was doing her PhD at Harvard. She was willing to speak to the lesser of us who were from small schools like Princeton. So, uh, very good. With that, I'm really pleased to welcome them. What we'll do is we'll start with the Azel, which who will give us a larger picture focusing on China. Then we'll have uh, Jim Healy focus on some macro issues relating to Federal Reserve's actions uh, and uh, other uh, activities in terms of the uh, uh, policy world. And then Sadiq Saeed, who is a master in terms of going from micro to macro and looking at issues relating to incentives and performance, will be the third one to come in and I'll chime in as uh, I deem possible in this hour. And then we'll have a time for questions and answers. So, very good. Leah, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have to say that I would not recommend that anyone aim for a career on Wall Street with a PhD in history today. Uh, when I entered uh, the financial world, uh, Wall Street was begging for people to go work there, and so they even took me. But I do not believe I would get a job there today. Uh, and one could say that about a lot of different professions, so pick your spots. Uh, thank you, Pan Schweinar, very much for uh, inviting me, uh, and I'm pleased to be here. So I'm going to talk about China. Uh, it's been in the headlines all summer as the epicenter of a global growth scare that has roiled financial markets and concerned policymakers worldwide. I'm a professional investor, as you know, uh, so my remarks are going to emanate from the vantage point of the financial markets, and they revolve around three overarching observations. Uh, the first is that Chinese, China's challenges are not new, 
but rather are embedded in their political economic model, which for lack of a better term, I'm gonna call authoritarian capitalism. Second of all, while the timing is always difficult to predict, I believe that these problems will invariably reach a point where China's leaders may have difficulty staying on top of them. And last of all, uh, that the global linkages which did not exist a generation ago mean that China's issues today have spillovers, uh, effects on economies and financial works and financial markets worldwide. Okay, so let's start with authoritarian capitalism. Uh, unlike the market for goods, services, and labor, and what you'll see is that I'm continually differentiating between sectors in China, uh, the financial sector is in many ways indistinguishable from the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, to put it bluntly, it has been the party's piggy bank and is deeply politicized. So in a, in a properly functioning market economy, the cost of capital is set by economic actors uh, who are motivated and compensated by the, the return that they earn on their investments. In China, by comparison, capital allocation has been subservient to the political objectives of the party. And there's this unspoken pact between uh, the Chinese people and the Communist Party that the former will cede control over the financial sector in exchange for the um, party ensuring that um, GDP per capita grows and that China prospers. Um, and the party has in fact delivered since Deng Xiaoping um, by funneling cheap capital uh, through financial repression to state-owned enterprises and local governments that then fund investments in fixed assets that boost GDP. Okay. okay, I think what we are seeing this summer is that that game is now ending. Uh, the, the, the slowdown that we are seeing in China and that is captured most by the official statistics is in the industrial and export-oriented sectors. Uh, the state-owned enterprises still comprise about 40% of GDP, but they're highly and certainly relatively unproductive and have delivered essentially no growth for the last five years. There's been capital misallocation uh, in real estate and in manufacturing. Uh, we don't really know the extent of the bad loans, um, likely understated, heavily concentrated at the level of local governments. Uh, meanwhile, private enterprises in China are three times more efficient at generating jobs per unit of capital deployed. Uh, yet they are uh, relatively starved of growth capital because the financial sector preferentially allocates capital to the state-owned enterprises. Okay, so let's talk for a second about what happened in the stock market in China this summer. Um, I don't think it really says much about the Chinese economy. I think it says a lot more about the dysfunctionality of the financial sector. Um, my best guess as to why the authorities manipulated this great bubble and then tried to protect uh, it from crashing is that they had this game plan to, uh, to get the state-owned enterprises to convert the debt that they have on the balance sheet into equities and so reduce the leverage in the system uh, it backfired. Uh, they've spent estimated $250 billion of their reserves trying to keep it from crashing so far, and that amount is growing. Even before this summer's financial uh, recent turmoil, um, the mainland A share market is rife with fraud, it's rife with accounting problems, um, and it's actually below the nominal level that it traded at 20 years ago. Uh, it has not been the way to invest in China's growth. Uh, and finally, uh, heavy government intervention this summer has discredited its role as an allocator of capital and so distrust among foreign, the foreign investors it was ideally supposed to attract. So uh, don't pay too much attention to that. Okay, so what is the state of the Chinese economy? How fast is it slowing? And what do I think the leadership challenge is? Uh, I don't know how fast the Chinese economy is, is growing. I don't know anybody who does. I'm not even sure Xi Jinping knows how fast the Chinese economy is growing. 
uh, one of the consequences of the summer's turmoil is uh, that uh, there's much less confidence in the official Chinese GDP statistics. Uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, you know, there are bears out there, estimates that China's trend growth is at 3 to 4 percent per annum, and that's where they will be by the end of this decade. Uh, what everyone does agree is that in order for growth to keep on track, even at a reduced level, uh, Chinese leaders need to restructure those industrial and export-oriented sectors of the economy uh, that have been the drag and that are state-owned, and that they need to liberalize the financial sector and finally support private enterprise. Those are, you know, everybody, this is like mother and apple pie. Everybody knows this is what they need to do. Um, and there's a limit to how much capital they can afford to waste. Uh, and in this case, the parallels with Japan post-1990 are perhaps instructive. Um, the dilemma is that those in charge of fixing the problems um, are also those who have been their beneficiaries. Uh, of the, you know, 50 top SOEs, every single top manager has been appointed by the party and is a party member. Um, and there are 155,000 state-owned enterprises. Uh, at the lower level, four out of five managers are appointed by the party. So this is a state-controlled you know, part of the economy. And it's also obviously been a way in which party members have lined their own pockets through innumerable clever schemes. Um, uh, so does the leadership at the top have an incentive to fix this? Uh, well, fixing it involves, as always is the case with these kinds of structural uh, uh, reforms, uh, putting in place the kinds of institutions and economic centers, incentives necessary to move the country back up the uh, wealth chain. There was a long article in the New Yorker in April, uh, a profile of Xi Jinping called Born Red. If you're curious, it's, it's lengthy, it's like 12 pages, New Yorker does that, but it's very instructive in terms of his mentality, which is, that the Communist Party is the only possible institution that can rule China, and that the priority or the, the <coughs> imperative, his imperative, is to maintain the power of the Chinese Party, and that the economy serves that purpose. Uh, I don't see that his mentality is such that he's really wedded to the reforms that are necessary. Okay, so um, I, I don't want to be totally negative here. I hope I'm not giving you this impression that China is going down the rabbit hole. Uh, in fact, compared to many emerging markets, it has clear advantages in tackling its problems. Uh, the services sector is growing at double digits. Uh, retail sales are good. I don't know that the broad brush economic statistics that we're catching in the West are capturing. Uh, this, China, is also running a monthly trade surplus of $40 billion. Uh, the government has the fiscal and monetary wherewithal to reflate the economy, uh, at least for a while. Um, and uh, if you look at, you know, a lot of other emerging markets, China is politically stable. Uh, and just this weekend, there's an independent uh, uh, a private sector research firm in New York that issues what's called the China Beige Book. And uh, they have come out and said that uh, attitudes towards China today are as divorced from reality as they've ever seen, that the economy is actually doing a lot better than people think. Uh, nonetheless, over, the long, over a longer period of time, and, and call it five years, I really think the issue here is political will. Okay, so finally, disagreements. You've seen um, um, very inconsistent pronouncements from the top Chinese leadership this summer, and that's part of what's gotten everybody upset. I think that they probably reflect uh, power struggles within the elite, uh, and one fac faction uh, emerging and saying one thing, and another faction emerging, bat batting them down, and then the Chinese authorities say something else, uh, my assumption is that the uh, stock market meltdown and uh, the, all of the, the fiasco of the small 
devaluation of the renminbi uh, together are more likely than not to set back the reform agenda of the state-owned sector and the financial and financial liberalization in China, uh, possibly through the end of Xi Jinping's reign. Uh, so finally, uh, third, third bullet point through third section of my talk, implications for global markets. Uh, globalization always had a downside, and we are selectively seeing that play out now. Uh, you can chart the winners of the last 10 to 15 years when China built up its industrial complex, and I think you can then identify who the lo losers will be of the next wave. Um, the commodity super cycle has run its course, and the prices we saw a decade ago are not coming back anytime soon, absent uh, major inflation. Uh, capital goods manufacturers in developed markets such as Germany and Japan are feeling pain. Uh, Volkswagen stock dropped 20% today for other reasons, but it had been coming down hard before that because they probably make over half their profits in China, as do all the German car makers. Um, I think companies like Unilever that have been selling expensive shampoo in Places like China and emerging markets are going to find that there are local competitors who are going to be happy with, with uh, tighter margins, and they will either match those margins or lose market share, which is not good for them. And luxury good manufacturers have seen sales of everything from cognac and Swiss watches to uh, plummet. Um, Measuring the uh, exposure to China by direct bilateral trade understates the impact uh, because of sp spillover effects to Chinese trading partners, more, more particularly uh, the emerging markets, uh, and that would be the contagion mechanism that would threaten global growth. Um, uh, we all know that the emerging market currencies have plummeted, have come down very hard. Uh, it's my personal opinion that emerging market equity and debt markets have yet to bottom because there was an enormous amount of capital that went into the emerging markets through about two, from about like 2009 to 2012 because they were perceived to be, to have better balance sheets and better growth than places like Europe. And of course, that was exactly the wrong trade because that was the peak. Um, so uh, I think that that capital has still not come out and uh, I wouldn't be a buyer of emerging markets until I see that happen. Uh, why are emerging markets so vulnerable? Well, a plausible scenario would be that as demand from China decreases, that pressures corporate margins uh, of uh, particularly commodity producers, uh, corporate margins in high-risk economies, uh, to the extent that they uh, have dollar-denominated debt because they sold their goods in dollars, uh, that stresses the local banking systems as credit quality deteriorates, that then spills over to sovereign credibility and then challenges uh, political stability as current account deficits mount. Your poster child for this has been Brazil, uh, Russia, South Africa, Turkey, Indonesia, and Malaysia to name, Malaysia, to name a few countries are not far behind. Uh, my worst case scenario in looking at China is that capital flight leads to an abrupt RMB devaluation uh, because that would export deflation to tradable goods worldwide. Not a good thing, especially if it were shock, you know, in a shock fashion. Gradual RMB depreciation may be inevitable, but it's better if it's managed. I would expect that China that you know, if this slowdown persists, that China will announce some kind of stimulus program fairly soon. Uh, longer term, the range of possible outcomes is both broader and more nuanced. Uh, like Japan a generation ago, China faces a demographic time bomb. Uh, unlike Japan, it has not yet gotten rich, and so it will need to confront some hard choices to avoid uh, what is known in Jan's profession is the middle income trap. Uh, regarding uh, investments, uh, the near term outlook favors, as I've indicated, developed markets over emerging markets. Longer term, uh, I'm going to give you a, what I call you know, a sort of anodyne comment, which is the capital flows to those countries and sectors that can embrace and implement structural change and to companies that can innovate. Um, 
and raise productivity. Uh, because so much of the action over the last two decades has centered on the external sector, I would place my money on a gradual retreat from globalization in favor of domestically oriented value creation, both in China and abroad. And, uh, and here I'm talking my own book on active management over passive indexing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. That was an excellent start, and we'll move to Jim Healy, who will turn to a little bit more domestic and global mixture. Thank you. Uh, I've got a lot of slides, so I'm going to move uh, fairly quickly so I don't hog the time. Um, but I want to start with a quote from Bernanke uh, to set the stage. Um, this is this quote here. Uh, I'll leave Hippocrates to you. Um, but he, what, he wrote, what he wrote in 2008, in September, the kind of financial collapse that we're now on the brink of is always followed by a deep, long recession. If we aren't able to head this off, the next generation of economists will be writing not about the 30s, but about this. And for those of you that remember the crisis when it began in 2007, it did seem, by any measure, that the US economy was in a meltdown. And, and Bernanke is not one that's given to overstatement. And I think that we're very fortunate that he was at the helm, having studied the Great Depression, having also studied Japan very carefully. I think we were very fortunate that, that he was at the helm in the, when a crisis like this. Now, what I want to do today is the Fed uh, met on Wednesday and Thursday and elected not to raise rates. And those of you know, the Fed funds rate has been at 25 basis points now since 2008. What I want to do is go back in time and contrast the world, the, the emergency that Bernanke in, uh, saw occurring in 2008 with the world that exists today. And having done that, put in perspective the decision that the Fed made last Thursday <coughs> not to raise rates. Okay? So let's go, you know, sort of the key point here is that I, there's a policy tension. The Fed has a dual mandate. One is a growth employment side of it, and the other is an in, inflation target. And there's a tension between it. And what you'll see in my slides today is that the, the, if you look at the employment and growth considerations, you would have, that would have argued strongly for a rate hike. If you look at the inflation consideration, that would argue against it. And there's this tension. And that was, the, that was the tension that the Open Market Committee was grappling with last week. Uh, I think there is one certainty is, I don't think it matters if the Fed moves in October or December. Uh, I think they will move once and to bump it off the floor, and I think they will pause. Uh, and I think at the end of this presentation, you'll probably see why I say that. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide in detail other than just the main bullet points is what you'll see today is I think moderate GDP growth is extremely well supported. So the outlook for GDP growth looks fine. Inflation, as you'll see today, is too low. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, the Greece, less so recently, but Greece and, and of course China. And my view on that is they, that should not have a direct impact. But the indirect impacts can be important, and the indirect impact would be if it causes disorderly markets, as we had just a few weeks ago. Uh, and the, the Fed, that would impact the timing of a rate hike. It would indirectly, if, if events in China cause inflation in the United States to drop farther, I think that would have an, an impact. But not China slowdown per se. It's the impact, the mechanism, the channel by which it impacts policy in the United States, I think is through the inflation channel. And I think we could have a flatter curve in terms of the shape of the curve. Um, let's go into this. Um, the, what they were grappling with then is the, the case that was persuasively made by some top economists against hiking rates is that inflation is too low, employment has room to improve, 
Housing recovery has much farther to go, and there's no significant capacity constraints, and there's, you, you're in an uncertain international environment. Those are all true statements, and that's the side that, that basically argued at the Fed meeting, I believe, saying we should leave rates alone. The case for rising rates uh, raising rates were that the zero rates that we have, we've had for seven years, and they, we got to zero because we were in a state of emergency, as Bernanke, my quote from Bernanke points out, and that state of emergency has long since passed, and I think you'll see that. The other point is that zero rates, and it's a little bit from what Leah was saying, zero rates or near zero rates distort the investment and savings uh, decisions that economic agents make. If you look at borrowers, it flatters government debt because the debt service is, is artificially kept low. Borrowers will overstretch because the cost of borrowing is so low. And corporations will use the opportunity to lever their balance sheet by issuing debt and, and buying shares. There's no, in that exercise, there's, that has no impact whatsoever on GDP. That is simply just a trade of financial assets where the investor swaps uh, debt for equity. Um, I think normalizing, if you could get rates off the floor, you would, you would create uh, an ability for monetary policy to work again. Uh, and I'm going to skip the last point. The, um, in terms of GDP growth, I can see GDP growth easily at the 2.5% level. The last quarter was 36 but if you sort of say, where does two and a half come from? In, uh, consumption, I think, is going to be good for 2% by itself. And that's not a, that's a 3% growth of consumption. That's not huge. You have residential construction, which is finally improving after all the stimulus that has been provided. Uh, intellectual property is another aspect of, of uh, investment, uh, which kicks in routinely 0.3 to 0.4. And that's sort of what you think of as the Silicon Valley uh, technology uh, aspect of investment. You add those together, you're, before anything else, you're already sort of at 2.7. Uh, if you can get some extra benefits from the state and local government, uh, which has improved their, their balance sheets a lot, as well as from other areas like non-residential construction. And that would allow, that would buffer some shocks and we might get some, some uh, negative growth out of the trade sector as an example. So that's why I, th I think that, that if you, the, the outlook, the medium term outlook for growth, 2.5% feels very realistic. Now this is the graph of Fed funds. So, and this is just going to set the stage, okay? So the crisis started to occur in the fixed income markets in 2007 and they ramped it down extremely quickly to 25 basis points, that's December 2008, so that's after the, the Lehman uh, crisis, and there we are ever since. Now what follows, and you have to watch carefully because I'm gonna move, you're always gonna see this graph, on, but it's gonna reference the right-hand um, vertical scale, and what I'm gonna show you is a host of other economic indicators on, that you'll see, and, and you'll look at what, what the economic indicators were at the time that they took it down to 25 basis points, and where those economic indicators are today, okay? So here we go. The, this is real GDP growth. So at the time that they went down to um, 25 basis points, real GDP growth that quarter was minus 8%. And, and it stayed negative, and stayed negative, and stayed negative, and then has sort of moved around. Now, if you look at this part of the graph and this part of the graph, they're not so completely different. But the big difference is in this part of the graph, you had Fed funds rates uh, off the right-hand scale of 3%-ish or higher. Now you're seeing Fed funds rates at 25 basis points. So in each of the following slides, I want you to sort of look at where it was, look at where it was in the crisis when they went down to 25 basis points, and then look where it is today. I'm gonna to go across consumption, consumer confidence, investment side of it, uh, particularly the real estate side. We'll, we'll, look at, we'll look at what I think are the economic variables that the Fed is looking at when they come to the decisions they make. 
First of all, this is household debt to GDP. At the time of the crisis, it had ramped up from 80% to sort of 115%. Um, and that was a very, very levered environment. That was, in other words, it's an environment in which if the Fed didn't move, there could be loads of bankruptcies because, the, because of the consumer's balance sheet. They now look at where it is. So now it's back at where it was in 2003 or 2004, and the, we're at 25 basis points. This is household net worth. Household net worth was dropping sharply at the time that they dropped it in December 2008. Look at household net worth today. The consumer is in just a dramatically different place. This is housing prices. This is the Case-Shiller Index of housing prices. At the time that they were dropped rates, housing prices, the index had dropped, was in free fall, really. Continued to fall, housing prices have, have recovered significantly since the, since the emergency. This is the S&P index. The S&P index at the peak was about 1550, dropped down here to 800, in fact, lower 700. There's the S&P today. Fed funds is at 25 basis points. This is consumer confidence. Consumer confidence in the crisis was plummeting. 100 is, is the, was the level it was even before the crisis. The consumer confidence went down to I think is an all-time low of some, uh, did I do that? Yeah, um, down towards 20%. Consumer confidence is back at 100. Fed funds is at 25 basis points. Credit. Credit was collapsing. Banks were the, were the owners of the consumer debt and, the, and the, resident, the mortgage debt. They were pulling in their horns. People thought the world might end. Consumer credit was dropping off. And the reason the Fed initially went to 25 basis points was really to provide liquidity and, and for solvency, that you, or liquidity, so that you, people could actually get money that the banks weren't lending. They wanted to flood the system with liquidity. There's, there's um, consumer credit today. Consumer credit today is higher than it was before the uh, recession. If you look at non-farms payroll, you're, you're losing 800,000 jobs a month at the time of the crisis. That was the world Bernanke described as, if, if we don't fix it, we'll be writing about this, not the Great Depression. <coughs> the, over the last year, uh, it's averaged 217,000 jobs positive every month. So the, the employment situation is miles different. If you look at the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate was rising from sort of 4.5% of course, on its way to 10%, the, employment, the unemployment rate today is at 5.1%, not miles higher than it was pre-crisis. Fed funds rates, 25 basis points. This I didn't uh, get a chance to do two scales. This is job openings. So it's an idea of, of how, wh what are the job prospects in the market today? And this is measured as a percent of the labor force. So it's 3.9% of the labor force, which this, this time series goes back to 2005. There are loads of jobs out there. And, and if you, again, they're looking at why are people unemployed and what is the level of structural unemployment. And if there's these many jobs outstanding, there clearly should be some element of structural unemployment. Look at investment. At the time of the crisis, investment this is, uh, this is investment in equipment, was dropping sharply from here to there. In, and now look at investment. Fed funds, 25 basis points. If you look at, this is manufacturing industrial production. Again, you get the same pattern. It dropped sharply, crisis. Now it's back at above 50, which is a positive sentiment. If you look at services, this is the uh, Institute of Supply Management, non-manufacturing, which is basically services, same story. You look at capacity utilization, same story. We're back at the levels we were at in 2003, 2004, but in 2003, 
uh, and 2004, we didn't have Fed funds rate at 25 basis points. Now, this slide's a little different. What this shows you is this, this is the, the, the depth here. It's how far each of these markets fell. These are the 20 major real estate markets in the United States. This is how far they fell. So, for instance, real estate, residential homes in Las Vegas fell 60%. The green part of the bar shows how much they've recovered. The blue part shows how much those markets are still underwater. Okay? Of course, Denver and Dallas is, is 20% higher than they were post at, at the peak. So they're net, net higher. All these kind of Boston, Charlotte, Portland, San Francisco, Seattle, they're all within spitting distance, five or six percent, which you could get easily in the course of one year. They're back. And then you end up at the other end, aside from Las Vegas, sort of the retirement belts of Phoenix, Tampa, um, Miami. Then you have Chicago, Detroit, New York. So there's some wood to chop here. And where you'll see that because those prices have not recovered as broadly, but have recovered, you're seeing a rather tepid recovery in residential construction. You know, supply should follow prices. If there are higher prices, people will, will build new homes. And, but you finally are starting to see what I think is a gradual and will accelerate uh, recovery in residential homes. So this is the, this, so far, this is the only slide that suggests that there's some weakness vis-a-vis -vis where we've come from pre-crisis. Now, this slide is the reason the Fed didn't hike. And what this is is the U.S. Personal Expenditure Inflation Index. Everybody knows the CPI. This is a slightly different index that the Fed thinks is a better index in terms of being representative of, of real inflation in the economy. And, and their target is 2%, okay? So they'd like to see it up here, okay? It's not, it's at 125, but importantly, it's been dropping. And, and that, if you look, the last time it was this low, it was in 2003, and Fed funds rates were 75 basis points. So we have this tension between growth and inflation. Now, there's, people have done work on, on how to balance that tension between Fed funds and inflation. And the, the, probably the seminal work is attributed to John Taylor, although there are two other economists that propose the same idea at the same time. But Taylor's name's on it. It's called the Taylor Rule. And the idea behind the Taylor Rule is it's a guide for policymakers uh, that balance the trade-offs between spurring in, uh, growth and, and controlling inflation. And basically the way it works is you take a real rate of return, in this case, say 2%, you add on the inflation rate, in this case, one and a quarter. And then, so that would suggest everything else equal, that would suggest a three and a quarter percent Fed funds rate. But then what you do is you adjust it by if, it, if employment, unemployment is higher than you'd like, you adjust the interest rate down, or if inflation, uh, if inflation is lower than you'd like, you adjust it down. So, and, and so that is exactly what this blue line is. And so when, when there's huge unemployment, the Taylor rule is suggesting you should have negative rates. Well, you can't have negative rates really as a policy matter. Okay, then it's recovered. The Taylor rule is now suggesting that we should have a Fed funds rate of two and a quarter. And actually probably two and a half, we're at 25 basis points. So, so that, is, that is the economic backdrop that, that I think the Fed looked at on Wednesday and Thursday. And so what is it, why, why didn't the, the Fed move? And I think what it does is it tells you that their weighting of the, of the risks is very different than what the Taylor rule would suggest. And I think it has a lot to do with what I don't think it's in the growth side of it. The growth side of it you saw was really strong fundamentals and certainly wouldn't justify a 25 basis point uh, Fed funds rate. I think the Fed is very concerned about inflation. 
I don't think they give, they, they focus very heavily on whether China's growth is good or bad. I think they focus very heavily on whether China's slowdown impacts commodity demand. And if they slow down, the commodity demand slows down, commodity prices drop. I think that's one aspect of it. I think if you look at the oil price, and part of that, of course, is the new uh, supply from the US. Uh, part of it is Saudi Arabia has been very accommodative in terms of providing oil, but oil prices have dropped in half. I think if you look at the inflation or the, um, the currency appreciation of the US vis-a-vis -vis the countries that it imports raw materials from, all these things suggest that the supply curve would shift to the right, which should lower prices. And in my opinion, that is how international effects through the currency, through the price of oil, through commodity prices, influence the Fed decisions to stay on hold. I think they're very concerned. The only bad indicator of all these indicators I've gone through, and I have not cherry picked it, is that inflation is miles away from where they'd like it, but I think importantly, they're very worried that it continues to fall. And it's not just volatile energy prices. Volatile energy prices will feed through a deflationary impulse into everything that uses those products. So, so that is what, what happened, I think. The Fed believes that they can get away with it because there's no wage pressure. I think that was, was also a backdrop. Is there really, do, if wages are starting to rise, yes, I should be more concerned about inflation, but they're not seeing it. So they felt that they could wait. Here are the yield curves. Going, now this pulls it into the market. This is the, the green curve is the yield curve that existed a year ago, and the black curve is a curve that existed today. And so you can see that it was much deeper, and that implies, you'll see in a minute, that implies a, a path of Fed funds policy rates, which was much steeper than it is today. Now, if you look at and say, what is it that happened during this period, and there's two things that happened. One is this is the period in which inflation started to decline. And, and the market correctly perceived that the Fed may adopt a slower path because of inflation. And the second thing is that the other end, the far end of the curve, seven years and out, has been distorted in, from, from a fundamental standpoint by international demand from, from uh, investors like in Germany, where the 10-year rate is at 25 basis points. And they have an opportunity to buy 10-year paper in the United States and pick up multiples of that yield, as well as pick up an appreciating currency. If you have a yield curve, you can imply a yield curve today, a snapshot of the yield curve today, you can calculate what the market's expectation is of policy rates out for 30 years. And this, the blue curve, is the curve that existed a year ago. And this light blue curve, I poor choice of colors, but the lower curve is the curve that exists today. And so what the market has done is said, when the Fed moves, we think it's going to move at a much slower rate than we once did. Um, for what it's worth, what I don't like about what the market, the market is seeing, they think that policy rates end up in 10 years from now, so 2025 at 3%. That strikes me as too low. And I think that, that, that you see that because of the, the aberration of very, very low rates in Europe pushing the 10-year rate down. I think that, that you should see a more of a 350, which is what we had a year ago. And if, I, if that were true, you would end up with a Fed funds path that looks a lot like what the market's expecting, except it peaks at 3.5 instead of uh, 3%. What that means is the curve, what I would think of as a more normal curve, free of distortions, would be the black line as opposed to the red line. It's about 20 basis points different. And finally, not only can you pick the curve today, a yield curve today, not only allows you to calculate the, the path of Fed funds every day for 30 years, it also allows you to calculate what the curve's going to look like each year in the future. And that's what this shows. So it's showing at year end, it'll be a little higher than today. And then the curve's going to go very, very flat in 2021 uh, at 
but the moral of the story, what I guess what I'm trying to leave you with is I think that you have two issues here, but one issue is the, f the f people are focusing on whether the Fed's going to change rates. I think that, that what's lost in that is whether the level of rates was correct. The, I would argue that the level of rates at 25 basis points adds such distortion in terms of the saving investment decision that it would behoove the, the Fed to normalize uh, rates because, to avoid that distortion, to avoid the distortion of governments borrowing too much, high yield uh, companies uh, borrowing too much, uh, investors that need fixed income returns stretching into riskier assets. There's, there's a host of distortions and there's a cost of this uh, 25 basis points or zero rate interest policy. The reason they didn't move I think is largely due to international aspects, and the international aspects as it went through are commodity impacts, currency impacts, and the impact of oil as, as a separate commodity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. This is uh, terrific. So we have now the two of you, the international, the uh, US, and we'll ask Sadek Saeed to give us uh, the synthesis. Uh, Jim, you've, uh, you've left me with very little to say. Um, fascinating, mate. I mean, it really is interesting. Can we just take off my slides for a minute? Because I just want to give a bit of background, and I'll, we'll go to the first, uh, first slide. Thanks. Um, what I'm going to try and focus on is a little bit um, and try to draw you back from the economics um, that Jim articulated and what Leah articulated, is to try and draw a connection between what we as normal people see has happened in China, uh, interpret how the Fed behaved, and then take a look at how markets actually react to things. And finally, how do policymakers react to how markets react? Um, it's a hard act to follow Jim's and Leah's, but let me try and give you a couple of quick examples about what I mean. On Thursday, when the Fed did what it did, um, a couple of days before that, what the market had done was the stock markets had gone up quite a bit, and as Jim's yield curve picture showed, the yield curves were fairly stable in predicting a fairly steep outlook for how rates would evolve over time. And the Fed changed all of that in one move. Although the markets were anticipating the Fed would do exactly what it actually did do. The markets essentially started to decline pretty much after Yellen started to speak and continued that decline for a couple of days. And they're down about a percent and a half, Jim? About a percent and a half from the time uh, that the Fed actually changed its rates. The question that I always try to answer, or try to look to answer, is to what extent are policymakers reacting to markets, and to what extent are markets reacting to how policymakers will react to markets? It's not as circular as you might think it is. In China, for example, growth rates in China have remained on a downward decline for as long as a year, would you say, Leah, if not longer than that? And anticipated growth rates have been lower and lower and lower virtually every month that you care to look at the numbers. Yet, the markets in China continue to fly. Uh, the, the government and the policymakers in China encouraged significant external investment and significant modernization, as it was called, in the Chinese markets. The bond market um, in May was opened up to international investors to the tune of $3 trillion equivalent. Um, but the minute things started to go slightly wrong, China reverted to form. And they put restrictions on short selling. They put restrictions on people selling shares that they already owned. They put restrictions on international investors exiting. 
They put up costs for settlement of futures contracts. And as a result, pretty much changed the perception of market participants in the Chinese markets. Now the question is, what were the markets doing letting the Chinese stock market go up in the way it did, knowing, pretty much knowing full well, that if the bubble burst, or if the bubble showed signs of being of bursting, that the Chinese authorities would always revert to form. Why were markets not fully cognizant and aware of that? Let me try and show you another slide which demonstrates a bit of that. Oops. Can we go just to my first slide? Not that one. The, the picture. There you go. That's the one. Thank you. Um, this is a picture of... Uh, Should I stand up? I'll take this up with me. Can I take this with me? Um, as it says, this is European 10-year government bond yields looked at from 2004 through 2008 through December 2000 and can't touch it. I mean, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if I can I go back to, yeah, thank you, uh, to 2009 and then subsequently till December 2014. And I've... I've given you pictures of uh, the more interesting European countries here. And here's the interesting thing. Post December 2008, a little bit of volatility started to exist between the different rates at which countries could borrow in the European mechanism. But up until then, it was an incredibly flat curve. That means that Germany, borrowed at approximately the same rate as Greece could borrow, up to 10 years. The markets pretty much knew what governments knew about the condition of each of these countries. But most importantly, the markets understood what gaps there were in the European mechanism that would not allow for volatility to exist. Not rather, not allow for volatility, if it existed, to be controllable, i.e. there was no tax system that existed within the European mechanism. Markets knew that around here. Nobody focused on it. Markets knew that all the way through December 2009. Oops, I didn't touch it. I promise you I didn't touch it. <laughs> all the way till, do, till December 2009. And yet, there was an implicit acceptance within the markets that regardless of what happened to the credit risk of an individual country, the bonds would essentially exist within the same risk framework as the safest country in the market, Germany as an example, or France. All the way till two th December 2009, that's an awful long time after the crash started in 2008. So the point I'm trying to get across is there was an implicit contract in the markets as to how they expected policymakers to react. When things started to go pear-shaped in 2009, as far as Greece was concerned, and the markets began to understand that there really wasn't a mechanism within the European exchange rate system to bail out a country that had gotten, it itself, gotten itself into trouble, and that there was a pretty good chance there would be no way of bailing them out, then, and only then, did the yields start to diverge. And boy, did they diverge. If you take a look at the UK, which is a sort of very pink curve here, I don't really mean that, but this pink curve here, it didn't behave in the same way as the European curves did. And what ought, the only reason for showing you this is to, for you to understand that markets trade securities on an assumption. And that assumption is that the policymakers will behave in a particular way. Policymakers ought to know, or, do they, or they do know, 
that markets are behaving on that assumption. As an example, in 2008, September 15th, when Lehman Brothers happened, up until September 15th, as Jim said, since 2007, people knew that the markets were going to be in turmoil. There was no question about it. I remember very well what we did at Nomura in 2007, and that was an anticipation of markets not being, the credit markets in particular, not being in as good shape as you would have imagined. But the credit markets continued to trade. They did not freeze. On September 15th of 2008, they actually froze. The markets actually froze. And for four or five days after that, illiquidity was the name of the game. You could not get out of positions. You could barely trade the most liquid security, what were considered the most liquid securities in the market. Repos were shut down, essentially. And securitized trading was pretty much out the window because people did not understand what the rules of the game were post-September 15th. Everybody anticipated that Lehman Brothers would be bailed out. Lehman Brothers anticipated that Lehman Brothers would be bailed out all the way till that fateful Sunday, and it did not happen. And the point is, what do policymakers do that changes the implicit contract and the understanding of the market of what the rational response of policymakers is going to be? Hence TARP, hence the reaction of the policymakers to come back within that week in a massive way and say, essentially, by their actions, we didn't really mean that. That's what they really had to do. That's what they really had to say. We didn't really mean that. They had let Bear Stearns get bailed out. They had let Northern Rock in the United Kingdom get bailed out. And so there was, by the time September came along, an assumption within the markets, and particularly within Lehman Brothers, that perhaps Lehman Brothers would be bailed out as well. And it's like playing chess. If in the middle of the game somebody tells you your knight no longer moves in this crooked way, you're going to pause for a while and consider what your next move is going to be. And every move in chess anticipates what the other people are going to do and what their moves are likely to be, and your own post that. Markets behave in exactly the same way. And if you take a look at what's going on in the markets today and the massive change in the yield curve, Jim, I mean, if you look at it in percentage of yield terms, within a day, that yield curve moved from being pretty much level, you know, steep approximately where it was for an awful long time. And in one day, in one Fed move that was unanticipated, really, although the newspaper said it was anticipated. It was really not anticipated, exposed, you can see. The yield curve shifted in a dramatic way, anticipating how the Fed is going to behave over time. So what I'm trying to say is, to what extent do policy makers and markets interact with each other? Should they? Should they not? And in my opinion, it is incredibly important to understand what market reactions look like to policymakers and what markets behave policymakers will do. Because if you don't see the circularity of that, very often you get policy wrong. And it's possible that Janet Yellen got policy wrong on this occasion because she was too concerned, potentially too concerned, about market distortions, as Jim pointed out. He said that could be one of the reasons. It could be. It could very well be the impact of that on deflation in the United States, but clearly, Changes in how the markets were behaving post-China had an impact on what the final decision was. It may not have been 100%, but it clearly influenced her. And the question that everybody really has to ask is, if everybody understood what China's growth rates looked like and what China's economy looked like, why did the markets in China behave in this incredibly volatile fashion? And then, if everybody also understood in the markets that the real economy in China was declining at a steady rate, but the markets had blipped up and blipped back down. Why did that little bit of blip up and blip down, little in our terms, big in Chinese terms, have such an important impact on where the markets are today? Markets since China's volatility have really taken, uh, 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 not a dive, but they've certainly changed the outlook. Markets are no longer as stable, and the volatility levels in markets are no, is no longer what it used to be. The VIX index is up, down, up, down, and implied volatility and experienced volatility in the market is significantly higher than it was before China started to go a little bit 
crazy. But in reality, when you look at the real economics of it, that should never happen. Because the markets themselves went up and went down. And it was for technical reasons. Everybody says that the Chinese reaction to the markets was technically driven, driven by leverage within the system, driven by the fact that consumers, or rather retail investors, could borrow significant amounts of money. All of that is true. But if that is indeed the case, why are the Western markets taking such, an, such a serious um, uh, uh, outlook uh, to what China has done? My final comment is this. If um, we don't consider how markets behave and how policymakers react to markets, and then finally how markets react to policymaker behavior, it is very likely that we will make important mistakes in anticipating what future behavior, what the future behavior of the economy will look like. Because if the Fed, if other if regulators and others take a look at market participants to determine how they behave. It is very important for us as market participants to look at how the Fed or other policymakers and regulators are going to behave. And therefore, the yield curve is a bit more calculating what the yield curve looks like and what the evolution of the yield curve has to have embedded within it. Something that says that if volatility exists as you go forward in the curve, what is the policy response and how can that affect what the yield curve actually evolves like over time? And you have to put that sort of that curvature, the curvature of the yield curve into a probabilistic context and give it a distribution. And if you, have, if you do that, then some of the surprises that we think are surprises don't actually look like surprises. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sadek. So we have now a really nice picture going from the international global impact of what's happening in China and the other emerging markets to the decision-making within the large institutions such as the Federal Reserve and a perspective on the interaction and sometimes seemingly not as rational reaction of the financial markets to the policymakers and vice versa. Let's open it up for uh, questions and answers. You can ask questions directly related to what individual participants said or you can ask questions going behind beyond that. And why don't you introduce yourself quickly and ask the question. Hi, uh, this is Sriram. Uh, I'm a MIA student at Columbia. Um, I have a question for Leah. Uh, when you're talking about uh, uh, authoritarian capitalism, uh, when you refer to China as a whole, uh, I'm not a big fan of their system. Uh, but I also find a lot of, uh, you know, kind of comparisons with the U.S. capitalistic, at least the financial capitalistic model, uh, in the sense, uh, post the crisis in 2008, in terms of accountability, in terms of the systems, um, has there been any change that you see, uh, which is you know um, uh, made the system as a whole more foolproof, or uh, you know because it's the same elite amount of people who are controlling the financial system. Um, um, so, uh, any changes that have happened post two thousand eight, uh, from your perspective? Uh, I think the big change post two thousand and eight is the stimulus, the massive stimulus that the Chinese uh, adopted in response to the global financial crisis and they cast themselves as the saviors of the world economy because they were going to boost demand from China and avoid a recession in China in response to what was going on. Uh, the way you can look at what's happening now is they are having a huge hangover. So. A lot of what's going on in the at the top leadership right now is trying to engineer a quote unquote soft landing from a self inflicted wound. Um, and I I, I, I I so I was just in Japan last week, and a lot of the discussion I heard in Japan was comparing what happened to Japan in 1990 with where China is today. And uh, I talked to one very well-known strategist in Tokyo who said that what we did here in Japan was denial. That is, we you know, had this huge bubble, okay? And then when it started to unravel, we were not willing to recognize the bad loans. And we, you know, originally the estimate was it was $17 billion in bad loans by the time 
you know, the banks came clean five to eight years later, it was one trillion US dollars in bad loans. So the view is that, um, uh, you know, where the reason why it's, it's the same leadership, but they took a particular policy action in response to the financial crisis that was short-term oriented as opposed to long-term oriented, something that had been in their DNA that they had done a number of times before, but not when fixed asset investment was as far advanced as it had been by 2008. And it's, you know, it, it really, you know, the, the numbers are that, that China was investing 50% of GDP into fixed asset investing uh, in the immediate post GFC years, uh, that's just unsustainable. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, that's really the change in the in the environment and the why and the reason why. Uh, on one hand, they're letting the economy slow because they need to let it delever, but the leverage in the system was something they deliberately or inadvertently. Um, it, um, engineered. I was also asking about the U.S. financial system. Do you think it's evolved since 2008? In Somebody of else has to talk about the U.S. I, yeah, I don't live here. I think it's evolved a, a great deal, um, and mainly for the better. Um, and what I when I say that is, I think the what we what we discovered at the time of the crisis was that the banks were very, very levered and that, that this, there was no such thing as sort of stress scenarios that were rigorous stress scenarios to Just say in a crisis, crisis how is bank capital going to survive it? You know, will it be enough? I did some numbers a few years ago in which I came, if I marked the, the, the major bank's balance sheet to market in terms of the commercial mortgages that I have, the residential mortgages, which they typically would hold at cost, that most of the major banks were, were, would have negative capital, negative equity. So th I don't think that's at all the case today. I think with, with the rigorous stress testing that's been done, uh, banks are, are much, much, much better capitalized. It's, it's, I think it's night and day in terms of their ability to withstand a shock. So on that front, I, I think that the financial system has evolved um, a great deal and for the better. One can argue that, that in some cases, uh, things like Dodd-Frank might go too far. And, and it will, it's, maybe it's an iterative process that you're always fighting yesterday's war. Uh, the liquidity is in the market, as an example, uh, in the bond market, there's not nearly what it was. And that's because it's so punitive for uh, investment <coughs> banks and commercial banks that trade to hold inventory. So I think there's some good news and bad news, but on the whole, I would, I would classify it as very, very good news. Can I uh, just add something uh, to that, Jan? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, I, I agree with Jim. Can I just tell you, you know, the, the banks um, during the 2008, 2009 difficult time, um, most commercial banks, uh, even today, don't mark their assets to market. They carry them at cost, um, or you know, greater of co lower of cost of market, or you know, some some notional accounting figure. Um, markets often see right through it. The example is in two thousand and nine, Barclays Bank, which I looked at for obvious reasons, given that they were my competitor for the acquisition of Lehman Assets, um, particularly in the U.S. Um, traded at approximately 0.2 book. So it isn't as if the markets were fooled by the fact that Barclays wasn't really marking its asset base to market. They probably were more fooled than they could have been if, the Barclays, if Barclays did market to market. But market prices did reflect a significant discount to the bank equity that the banks carried on their balance sheet. And that's a very, very important consideration. In the new world, uh, very few banks are allowed to do this kind of lower of cost of market accounting. They need now to take any asset which even slightly looks like tradable, 
or looks like it's markable, they need to take that down to market price or up to market price in order to reflect reality. And it's the biggest bane of our financial system, this accounting uh, system that we use, uh, whether it's, it's US GAAP or international GAAP. Um, it, it is a nightmare because accounts just have absolutely no way of reflecting what is the true value of a banking uh, asset, whether it's an investment bank or a commercial bank, doesn't matter, because it's static, it's a single still shot, whereas all of these things are dynamic, they have lots of curvature to them, the assets that they carry on their balance sheets in terms of uh, sensitivity to market, to market prices. Um, and up until we get that right, we're going to have to make kind of educated guesses as to what the balance sheets are really worth. So it takes a while. Questions over there? <coughs> thank you, thank you. It was the most interesting set of talks. I'm going to introduce a bit of doom and gloom. Uh, there is a view, of course, that you know, the world economy has a lot of vulnerabilities and there is a real possibility or a non-trivial non probability of a serious uh, crisis again. It stands from the fact that global demand growth has remained very flat. In fact, that China was the main source of growth in global demand for a very long, long period. That is disappearing. European economy is still facing strong headwinds. Germany remains a kind of net drain on global demand with its huge trade surpluses. Very little sign of recovery in Europe. That as there has been some view because lo long period of, of, of quantitative easing and low interest rates have led to another asset price bubble. That balance sheets, there are all sorts of balance sheets vulnerabilities, particularly in Europe and emerging markets. And there is a potential, therefore, for another real crisis. Now, the U.S. is very different, and the question, of course, again remains, how long can U.S. remain decoupled from the rest of the Europe world economy, uh, you know, with the Chinese and the European economies being in the state in which they are, you know, in one side, China actually declining, Europe saying no signs of recovery. Where do you see, I mean, do you, is there a, do you, any one of you think there is a, some, significant probability of that kind of doom and gloom scenario? Uh, I guess I'll start off on that one. Um, no. Uh, I, I, is there a probability? Of course there's a probability, but do, would it be one that I would be keep me awake at night? I don't think so. Um, if you look at the U.S. economy, um, the U.S. economy exports represent, uh, I think it's 10% of U.S. GDP. Um, so it, we are, you know, you think of the U.S. economy as a big trading force. This is, is not a very open economy. It's open in the sense that there's free trade, but in terms of, of its, Im its impact on, on GDP, it's, the, it's not. There are a slowdown in, I think one could argue that a slowdown in China is actually a positive for the U.S. And, and it's because you end up with lower prices of commodities. Com China has been the marginal consumer of commodities, and as commodity prices drop, again, it sort of shifts the supply curve to the right, and prices drop, output should go up. Um, the inflation aspects I talked about in my, uh, there's a, the, the, the dark side of that would be the, the it, were we to move into a deflationary world. If you look at Europe, I think Europe, I, I agree with you, I think Europe is very sluggish. I think we're, we're continuing to have very accommodative monetary policy. I think we're likely to. Um, but does it, again, as it relates to the U.S. economy, can the U.S. economy live with that? I think it can. Um, so I would agree with you that, that I think the global outlook for growth with the slowdown in the emerging markets that are commodity exporters uh, Brazil as an example vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with China. I can see a slowdown in emerging markets. I can see sluggish growth in Europe. I see a slowdown in China. I think the U.S. is going to putter along at two and a half percent. And, but that's not your gloom and doom scenario. That's just your kind of sluggish, mediocre global growth prospects. Um, uh, Akbar, I, I mean, I think I see where you're coming from. And I, um, overall, of course, uh, Jim and I share the same view that, that 
um, in terms of market crashes, as it were, if that's the question you're really asking. Um, I, I find it very difficult to foresee one, but that if one could foresee a market crash, you know, we'd all be much richer than we are. So, um, but, but the probability is weighted against it. What I think is an issue going forward is that the main instrument that policymakers have used recently to avoid the repercussions of turmoil in the markets, of bubbles bursting, is monetary policy and interest rate policy. And to quite some extent, that instrument is no longer really available. Um, then you come around and you see where is the debt sitting? Where is leverage? As Galbraith said in his book twice, <laughs> um, the real, when you go back and you take a look at the various crashes over, over time, virtually every single one of them is characterized by either overall excessive leverage or excessive leverage in pockets where it shouldn't have existed. But almost always, it's a contingent claim that you have to pay somebody back regardless of what happens to you, i.e. debt. That's what causes these things. And the debt in the consumer world and the corporate world is pretty healthy right now. But where has it gone? Debt is kind of almost a zero-sum game. It doesn't just get extinguished because it doesn't get written off. Market values drop, but the debt still exists. It's sitting in government in, in government balance sheets, in the Fed's balance sheet, in the government's balance sheet, and it's not being marked to market, I assure you, because governments don't mark assets to market, nor their liabilities. Everything is done on an income, annual income statement basis. And therefore, my view is this. If there is going to be a crisis ever in the future, it's very likely that it will be fiscally driven or it will be driven via a tax system that reacts possibly in an inappropriate way to what's going on. Now, this, the, 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 the impact of that is much slower, much less immediate than monetary policy. But if you have a massive crash or a massive crisis of political type, of a political type in China or in emerging markets, and it starts to have repercussions in the rest of the world, you have a very, very, very difficult time managing your way through it because we don't have the instruments left. And all the debt all the balance sheets of the emerging markets, in particular, are the government uh, balance sheets are massively over leveraged. And so that's the fear factor. And I don't really have a proper answer for what happens to those balance sheets if there is the low probability event uh, of a crisis, a politically driven one or, a, or, or something like that. I don't think it's a financial one. I think it's something slightly different. Uh, you, just, sorry, partly inspired with this reading by Ari Atkin Green's book, I've just started reading it, in other words, I've just read the, uh, read the introduction and conclusion chapters, which is often where I end with many books. But anyway. Well, with Alan Greenspan, that's a pretty good way to go. <laughs> but Akin Green's book is actually, you know, one in which he seems to suggest that there is, there are real vulnerabilities and serious possibilities of a major crash. As I said, based on just reading the introduction and conclusion, I want to read the book. So what makes the market, I guess, two different views. <laughs> Hi, my, uh, my name is Frederick Herman. I'm also a student here at CBAM. And uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for great presentations. I want to ask about uh, the inflation, the ever important inflation. And I was just wondering if, uh, if you could elaborate, elaborate a little bit on why inflation is so low, because it seems that the system is awash with liquidity, and you, all, you already talked about oil prices uh, and, and other pressures, but elaborate a little bit on why we are seeing the, the downward trend and why inflation isn't picking up. It seems to be not a US-only problem. It seems to be global. Yeah, I think that I... Can I add to it just one other aspect? Just, uh, just yeah. um, you know, historically, governments, when they have a lot of debt, use inflationary tax, print money to get out of it. Can we expect something like that now? I'm just piggybacking here. And if so, how would they engineer the inflation given that they are worried that there is not enough of it and they cannot engineer it? <laughs> well, I don't think they can engineer inflation. Uh, I think they are trying their darndest to do it. Um, if you look at, and going to the, the awash with liquidity comment, um, you know, the Fed balance sheets exploded, the QE1, QE2, QE3. The, but where, what's happened is they bought bonds, they put out money. The, the money was basically recycled into excess reserves in the Fed. 
So the money is not, it's not like it's, you know, you think of inflation as too much money chasing too few goods, so there's a lot of money out there, so we should have inflation. But the problem is the money's not there. The, the money is, is sitting right back where it started, except the ownership's different. It's, it's in excess reserves in the, um, at, at the Federal Reserve. So, um, and, but your question really is why is there not more inflation, and just in general? And I think that, that I think a large part of it is, is commodity prices. And if you look at, if you look at uh, take CPI, take CPI, X food and energy. CPI, X food and energy is 1.8%. Not so horrible if you're, if you're sort of thinking too sort of normal. But, but the consumer expenditure index, as I told you, is one and a quarter. So obviously, the, so it's a, there's also the difference between core and non-core. But so food and energy's had a big impact, and I think largely it's energy. The Fed believes, and I sort of agree with them, that there's a transitory impulse of declining prices. One, declining prices, that it, it takes time for that, for the, the impact of declining prices to, to uh, flow through to the inflation index. But once prices have declined and stay declined, that impulse finds its way, feeds through, and then inflation starts to rise as, as normal, uh, sort of normal inflation reasserts itself. But it's swamped in the near term by the inflationary impulse uh, of the pass through from lower commodity prices. That's one aspect. I think another aspect is that in a, in a much flatter world technology uh, wise, that, that excess, um, Excess demand can have a lot more sources of supply to remedy it than you could when the world was not so flat. And that's a secular aspect to it. And I think the third aspect to it is that what we saw was we saw a lot of people leave the labor force. So there's been, as I showed in that graph, there's been no wage pressure. And, and even though as inflation, uh, uh, unemployment rates dropped from 10% to 5%, we're still not seeing a lot of um, wage pressure. I suspect we will, but it has not occurred yet. And question is why. It could very well be in that same period in which um, the unemployment rate dropped, you also saw the participation rate in the U.S. drop as well. Part of that was expected because it's baby boomers retiring. Part of it was not expected and not very well explained, and it's discouraged workers leaving the labor force. So to the extent that, that discouraged workers re-enter the labor force as uh, employment opportunities improve, you could you can continue to see very muted wage pressure, I think. So it's a combination. I don't think there's a silver bullet answer. Can I add one little a bit to that? I think there's one other aspect that I think we sometimes perhaps ignore, uh, which is uh, um, consumer good price pressure upward price pressure as a result of input pressure. So in Ch China, as an example, um, as commodity prices drop, their cost of manufacturing drops, obviously. But they have what we have always regarded as an unending supply of labor, so that their labor prices, which is a fairly significant input into a fair amount of the number of products we buy, um, has been <coughs> remarkably attenuated. The people, the Chinese wages have not grown as quickly as you might imagine, simply because there is a, a huge supply uh, of labor. Now, uh, with, with the Chinese economy slowing down, um, I have a suspicion that there may well be a cap on that potential growth in income levels in China. Uh, but more importantly, or as importantly, the investments in Africa and the emergence of India more and more because there's an enormous labor force in India, and I'm not even looking at Latin America, I'm looking at those three continents. And I mean continents, China, India, and Africa. Uh, there seems to be, looking forward, a fairly significant cap on wage pressure. And if that exists, then it's going to be very hard for the Fed, even though it's the largest economy in the world, um, to through its own internal monetary policy, influence global inflation levels. And that's the real point about globalization. At the end of the day, even the US suffers from the small economy syndrome. Yeah. 
You were to yeah. Okay. In that case, I think this is a perfect time. Unfortunately, we are out of time. But what we'll do is we'll stop the formal part, thank the participants, and you're welcome to come and ask more questions informally and individually. Thank you very much.